Okay, uh, thank you everyone for, for being here. Today I'll present um, um, some uh, work I did during my master's thesis, which uh, lies at, let's say, the intersection of uh, temporal logics, proof assistance, and category theory. So to summarize essentially what we're gonna, I'll, I'll be talking about uh, right now, we, I'll essentially present the categorical semantics of uh, temporal logic, which is based on the counterpart paradigm, which I'll explain shortly. And uh, I'll present some insights, let's say some uh, brief summary of what I've, we've uh, learned and uh, done by formalizing the, these categorical structures using a proof assistant ACTA based on dependent types and a library for formalizing uh, categorical constructions, which is called ACTA libraries, uh, ACTA categories. So first I'll start by presenting some, uh, a brief introduction to temporal logics and counterpart semantics. And then I'll move on to the categorical perspective on the semantics of these, these logics and their models, and then give some uh, insights on the formalization in ACTA, and then conclude with, uh, uh, with some future work. So uh, temporal logics in a single slide, more or less, temporal logics are essentially a formalism for specifying and verifying the properties of complex software systems. And the idea is the following. You represent your system as interest, of interest as a transition system, which we call the model. And this is an example of a transition system for a simple vending machine. So you start from the pay state, and the only transition available is to go into the select state where you can select the beverage that you want to buy. And for example, you might either want to get tea or you might want to get coffee as possible evolutions of, of our system. And the idea is to express the properties that you want this, your system to satisfy as, as formulas in a temporal logic. So for example, you might have this, the following formula, which says that always you eventually end up in the state where you pay, right? And you, but you do not have, for example, that you eventually end up in a state where you have the team, that the machine gives you team, because you might want, for example, to always get only coffee, right? So you go from pay to coffee, select, pay, coffee, select, forever. And then the idea is to use a program which automatically checks that these properties that we specified in this formal language are satisfied by the model or not. So uh, what we've seen so far is that states are essentially atomic points, right? They, they are not decomposable in any, in any sense. But in practice, often the states of, of, a, of a software system are, have more structures, more structure that can change over time, right? When you do a transition, for example. And so, for example, we might want to model the time evolution of graph topologies, where the states themselves are graphs. And you want to model the merging of nodes in a graph, the deletion of edges, for example or you might want to model processes in memory, right? So a state is a collection of processes which can be forked, be allocated and allocated. Or you might want to model the, for example, election algorithms, right? So uh, you have parties which can evolve, split, unionize and other things uh, during in time. Uh, so the objective of um, uh, the counterpart semantic I'll present shortly is how do we enrich these models, such as the transition system we've seen in the first slide, to express this kind of multi-component behavior, and how do we define some logics that, which can express the properties and reason on the fate of individual elements inside of the states? Well, the answer is yes, using counterpart models and uh, quantified temporal logics. So in standard linear temporal logics, which are essentially the elementary starting point for temporal logics, you have that the, you consider sequences of states, right? So these are called traces. And by uh, the color here, for example, red and blue, we indicate some kind of property that we want to identify over some states, right? So we want to say the state I'm currently in is red and the, the next one is gonna, be, is gonna be blue. The idea of the counterpart paradigm is to associate to each state a set of individuals, which we call worlds. So our traces are essentially sequences of worlds and the properties are not, set, are not on the states themselves atomically, let's say, but they're on the individuals inside of the world. So, which we denote here by the different colors. Now the question becomes, how do we represent transitions between, uh, between worlds? The idea is to use counterpart relations, right? So relations are essentially, counterpart relations are relations in the usual mathematical sense of subset of the Cartesian products, Cartesian product of the two worlds. And the intuition for these counterpart relations is that the two individuals, two elements in a world from a world to the next one are connected when intuitively they are the same individual after one temporal evolution. 
after one step. And we call these sequences of worlds and relations connecting them counterpart traces. Now, having defined these models, we can define a, a temporal logic on, uh, on these kind of models on counterpart traces. And the, the, the presentation of a temporal logic is essentially the standard one. So you have the usual propositional fragment, and then you have two temporal operators, which I'll explain shortly. And then we actually have the, this, this uh, temporal logic is a quantified one, right? Because we want to reason on individual elements of the state. So we have three different kinds of formulas, for example, identifying the two individuals as, as being the same, expressing the existence of an individual in the current, in the current world, and a generic uni unary predicate for individuals. The semantics for uh, formulas is that you essentially give for each world in, our, in your trace, you define the tuples or, of individuals which satisfy a given formula phi. So let's see an example. So, so we take the, the model we saw before, and I'll use this notation of validity to indicate essentially that this individual in this world satisfies the given formula where x is essentially a variable which, um, for simplicity, I'm, we'll just refer to the individual we'll be talking about. So in this case, we have the a0 in the first world satisfies the formula next red of x, because there exists a counterpart for a0, namely a1, in the next world, such that the formula red of x is satisfied for a1, right? And for example, we have in omega1, C1 does not satisfy next red of x because there is no counterpart at the next step which satisfies red. And C0, so I'm giving you the intuition for the next operator right now. And the intuition for the until operator is essentially, essentially the following one. So you start with C0 in the first world and you have the blue until red, right? And the intuition is essentially that you start by um, taking, seeing the, the first world that you're in and see whether the first formula, formula is satisfied or not. And you, you want to say there exists a world after some steps where the second formula is satisfied. And the, the, the first formula is satisfied for all steps leading to it. So you have C0 is blue. There exists a counterpart B1 for C0, which also satisfies blue, a counterpart B2, which also satisfies blue. And finally, there exists a step after some temporal, temporal evolutions where the second formula is satisfied. Uh, why did I say tuples? Because actually you can have not just one individual uh, satisfiability in, uh, for formulas, but and that obviously corresponds with the notion of free variables of your formula. So you have, for example, that together, A, A0 and B0 in the first world satisfy next x equals y, right? Because you have a counterpart for both elements in the next world, such that x is identified with y. And this actually, you can see allows us to model the merging of two elements. You can also have the empty tuple, and this essentially expresses the formula, the fact that the formula is closed, right? It has no free variables. And you can say, for example, in the third world, world uh, omega two, that there exists an X uh, such that next blue of X. And in, in this case, it would be C2, right? Because in the next world, there exists a counterpart, which is blue. Another a bit more con contrived example is that you can take A0 and C0, and you have that Th these two elements are different until there is a point in time after some temporal evolutions where the, they become identified with the same element, namely A3, right? Now, so far we have only seen traces, but this can easily be generalized to counterpart models, which are generic transition systems, so not just linear sequences of, of worlds. So a transition system enriched with worlds and the counterpart relations between them. And the main claim of, of uh, and the main idea of this talk is that these counterpart models can be understood within the perspective of, of category theory. So a counterpart model is essentially identified with these data. So you take a category W, a class T of selected morphism, morphisms of, of W, which you, you call temporal structure, and a pre-shift D from W up to rel, where rel is the category of sets and relations, which you call relational pre-shift. What's the intuition behind this? Well, as, as you might imagine, the objects of the category are identified with the states of the underlying transition system. And so the objects of W are essentially points in time, right? And the morphisms of W represent the transitions between states, right? So it's like a temporal evolution for, for a, given, a given world. So you go from one instant of time to the other, even by possibly other 
different morphisms. The state might evolve, evolve in different ways. And the temporal structure is used to identify the one-step transitions of the model. And the relational pre-sheaf in the counterpart setting assigns worlds and counterpart relations to states right, in the intuitive way. So let's see a very simple example. So you, what's the uh, usefulness of the temporal structure here, which we I highlight in red? Well, in a category, you have identities and compositions, but you don't, you can't really have, you don't really have a notion of what, what it means to evolve in one step, right? And we actually don't have any constraint on this temporal structure. You don't need to have any kind of connectedness or having all objects that they have uh, some sort of evolution with the temporal structure. And so you take a category and you essentially embed it into the category of sets and relations and you obtain the counterpart model, right? Now, how is the semantics of uh, the logic defined? Well, in, usually in uh, temporal logics, you um, define a um, re relation inductively between formulas and tuples of individuals for each world. And the categorical way of doing this is essentially via a, a tool called uh, classical attributes, which is essentially, um, let's say, first order notion of uh, satisfiability. And uh, the idea is that for each world, you define the sets of, of individuals in each world, which satisfy the, the, the formula fine. So you identify not all the individuals, but just a subset of them, which actually do satisfy the formula, right? This is the perspective of the categorical logic. And so here's just to give a bit of a formal definition, right? So a class, classical attribute of A on a given relational to shift D is a family of set for each world, omega in, uh, in W, such that A of omega is a subset of the, what the pre shift assigns to the world. So a relational pre shift gives us a common universe of elements. And a classical attribute is a given property, A. So you say that an individual in, in a given world is part of the classical attribute, attribute A when it satisfies this property, A. So let's uh, assume to have a kind of our model, right? And the, to give these semantics for formulas essentially amounts to giving, first of all, assigning a relational sheaf to context, which um, is essentially done by iter iterating the, the product of a sheaf in the usual pointwise sense, right? N times, right? And this essentially gives us a, a tuple of individuals for each world of, of the category. And, th and so the semantics for formulas are taking are, are, are given by are, are given by a classical attribute on this uh, relation on the relational sheet we just defined, which is the context of the formula. So, for example, you have the false is identified with no elements, right, for each world, and the true formula is, is identified with the entire sheet and all the individuals in the sheet. So you you, uh, you have the usual definition that you, that you can imagine. So this junction is just union. Negation amounts to set complementation. So, uh, equality is essentially defined by taking the uh, appropriate projections from the Cartesian product. And the existence then is defined by saying that there exists an, a B in the, given by the pre-sheaf such that AB satisfies the formula, right? And uh, how is the semantics of temporal operators given? Well, it's actually uh, a bit contrived, but the idea is to take a pre-sheaf X, which is essentially the, the context that we are working in, and two classical attributes, A, B, which I, I are essentially the semantics of the sub-formulas of the temporal operators. And so you, we define new classical attributes, which combine these classical attributes, A and B. So we define a next, we're not gonna go too much into the details of this. Um, we can define a new classical attribute next of A, right? If for every temporal development in the, in the category, there exists an, an element, Right, an individual Z, which is which is a counterpart of S, right? And this is a given by by, by this, right? So when you you take the pre sheaf and take uh, the the template where this is in the relation, and you want Z to satisfy the formula A. And for until you have more or less the the same idea, but you need to be careful because you you are talking about paths, right? Paths from from a given uh, world omega as given by the temporal structure, right? And you, you want to, for example, universally quantify over them. So over all possible uh, evolution, temporal evolutions from uh, a given starting point, you want this to be satisfied, right? And now, um, yeah, but the important thing is not too much in the detail because it's just the intuition I was giving, telling you before, but the important thing is that you have A and B as uh, the classical attributes for 
the for the subformulas of a until b, and this is just the becomes a you have a neat definition of a, of the semantics of temporal operators because you just use these classical attributes here compositionally. Now, how are the sem classical semantics, the classical inductive semantics, and the categorical one related in their models? Well, they actually have a good result. So the classical models and categorical models, models are, in some sense, equivalent because for any classical counterpart model, which is just a transition system, right, for sort of that one, there exists a categorical counterpart which satisfies exactly the same formulas, right? And the um, idea is actually the one you might be thinking of where you construct a freely generated category W from the transition system. So you take uh, as objects, uh, of the, the states of the transition system as objects and then transition as morphisms, and then define a relational pre-chief assigning worlds and relations. And then you restrict the morphisms which are generated by the category with the temporal structure T. And the interesting thing, which uh, since we're, we're gonna be talking about uh, the formalization later, is that this theorem here has not been formalized, but the construction that gives rise to it has. So this is gonna uh, turn, to, turn out to be useful later when we will talk about the relationship between uh, classical and categorical semantics. And a very interesting extension of, uh, of this setting is that we, want, we actually want to, in practical uh, settings, to not talk about just sets of individuals, but we actually want to have more structure on them. So we want to talk, uh, instead of sets, we want to talk about many sorted algebras over some signature. So we're gonna need a bit of a, a tech for this. Uh, the first one is the notion of relational morphism between two relational pre-sheaves. And this is the, essentially the notion that we will, um, to, to, to express the fact that algebras and transformations, relations between them have to uh, satisfy, to preserve the structure of the algebras. So you have two relational pre-sheaves X and Y, and you define not uh, a natural transformation between them, but a family of set functions between them. And this, you, you, you will see, corresponds with the intuition that al in algebras you talk about functions and not relations. And so uh, you define a family of set functions for each world, such that for, that for every um, error in, in the category, the two elements are related by X, if and only if they, and not, they're not on, if and only if, it's just an implication, right? So if they're related uh, before, they're also related after the transformation. This is intuition. And how do we extend the models? You we essentially take, let's say, sigma, many sort of signature. An algebraic counterpart model is just a, a tuple where we have omega and t, which are a category and the temporal structure, the same as counterpart models. And S is going to be a family of, of, of relational pre-sheaves, which as, uh, assign a relational pre-sheave to each sort of the signature, of the, of the signature, yes, and uh, which we indicate with these semantic brackets. And then we're going to be having a family of relational morphisms, F, is, which gives an interpretation for each uh, function symbol in the signature, right? And where the function symbol is assumed to have this signature, then this is the, the type. Right, of the relational morphism of the uh, given by the family. And as I was saying, this, uh, the fact that these are set functions is essentially, and the, the, this condition is satisfied, satisfied means that the, these morphism uh, preserves the structure given by the algebra. So let's, let's give a very simple example. Let's take the signature of directed graphs. So we have two sorts, node and edge, and the two function source and target with these signatures here from edge edges to node, which represent the source and target. And we have, for example, this kind of a model on the, the signature of graphs, of directed graphs, actually. And we have this graph in the, in the first world, which gradually gets shrunken down to a smaller graph. And so the data that we, can, that we need to provide is a relation between nodes, first of all, and then a relation between edges. Right? And actually, these essentially correspond to uh, homomorphism of, of graphs where the uh, relation between them is a relation, not necessarily a function, right? Um, and then we can talk about, uh, we can extend the logic that we introduced before, and we don't just have equality of terms of the, of the logic, but we can talk about um, the equality of, uh, of terms of, of the algorithm. Sorry, not individuals, but terms. So for example, we can have a macro which says that a given element E uh, an edge is a, is a loop, right? And we can say that E5, for example, in the last world is a loop. But we can also use the temporal operators, obviously, to 
express, for example, that E4 at the next step will become a loop because obviously there's that kind of relation to, that evolves to E5. And this is just to give a graphical intuition for what's going on in the categorical setting. And so you have two pre-sheaves which for each sort of the algebra, right, which identify both the uh, evolution of the evolution of the of the nodes and the evolution of the edges, and then you have these kind of not really natural transformation but set functions for, for both the source and target, right? Uh, right. Now we are going to be talking about a, a bit about the formalization. So Agda is a proof assistant essentially, which is based on the dependent types and also doubles down obviously as a programming language. And it can be used in practice to formalize these kind of mathematical constructions. And our work essentially consisted of formalizing uh, the, this categorical semantics of PLTL in, in ACTA and using the ACTA categories library, which I'll be talking about shortly. And with this kind of extension of algebraic QLTL, which also required a bit of work uh, when trying to formalize uh, multi sorted signatures in, in, in ACTA. And uh, we've also formalized a uh, classical set-based semantics to, let's say, popularize a bit this kind of uh, um, counterpart paradigm without the use of categorical logic. And also um, a brief presentation of the positive normal forms of QLTL, also in Agda, which is uh, related to an interesting problem due to the intuitionistic right, nature of dependently type proof assistant. Uh, so just to give you a bit of uh, numbers, which is more or less um, 1,300 lines of code for the categorical semantics, and the positive normal form includes also the classical semantics. And why is uh, giving a formal presentation of the logic a, a useful endeavor? Well, first of all, because it formalizes uh, the correctness, more or less, of, uh, of the construction we, we, we present. And we actually, by formalizing in a constructive proof assistant, you have a playground, right? Uh, a setting, formal setting, where you can experiment and test your logic. And, uh, and actually, giving this semantics uh, with a verified uh, uh, tool also establishes like a foundation for verified model checkers. So you not only have your model checker, which verifies your program, but the model checker, is, model checker itself is verified in some sense because you formalize the semantics that it's trying to, to capture. And given the constructive interpretation again, you also have practically have a program which can convert standard models given by transition systems into the categorical ones. Because as I mentioned before with the, with the theorem, we actually have a procedure which converts the uh, standard models into categorical ones. And the workflow is more or less this one. So you, the, you can define the semantics of your logic using categorical notion, notions in some sense. And then you, the, the user, for example, might provide want to provide a standard non-categorical transition system as the model of interest. And then you use the procedure that we have defined, which constructs the categorical model, model from the classical one so that you can apply the semantics that you've defined using categorical tools. So how, um, how did we formalize category theory things in, uh, in a proof assistant? Essentially, we used category, uh, this library called Agda categories. Um, and it's very, quite interesting to talk about the, some of the design choices of the library in the setting of proof assistants, especially. And uh, some useful remarks uh, and interesting ones that um, essentially characterize this kind of formalism in, in proof assistant is that, for, for example, they choose to give an internalized notion of equality between morphisms in uh, categories. Right? So you have a, a sort of this kind of opaque equality for morphisms between the categories, if between morphisms, between two objects. And this is essentially done to avoid having to postulate extensionality principles, which are something you need to postulate in Agda, for example. And this, as an implication, also means that you need to do this kind of set-weight uh, equational reason in, in proofs, which can turn out to be uh, uh, quite annoying because you need to always reason up to set -weight. And you also need to have additional coherences, which are needed when you work with these satellites. And for example, when you define a category, you also need an another piece of data, which says if that composition behaves well with satellite quality, for example. And in functors, you have a similar thing, where you have that in category C, if F is, is equal to G in the satellite, then they're also equal with the action of the functor on the morphisms. Another interesting uh, design choice of the library is that they uh, essentially define two associativity fields, one for one of which is actually redundant, redundant because you can define, define associativity 
but they also provide sim associativity. So it's just swapping, right? The 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 two sides, the left hand side and the right hand side of the of the of the data, and this is done so that up taking the op of a category twice becomes definitionally equal to sim. This is a an interesting uh, um, an interesting thing that was also documented in a, an article by uh, in, in 2014. Um, so how was our experience with aggregate categories? Well, essentially, we are quite pleased to work with it because we were quite pleased to work with it because it's really practical and flexible because there is no magic there in some sense involved in the, in the library. It's, it's all defined in Agda itself, right? And, um, and these desi design choices that I've um, shown you so far do not necessarily always get in the way of practical applications. Maybe uh, when not using uh, categories as data more or less, but trying to formalize theorems, these design choices do get in the way. And the main definitions used are actually not too complicated because we just, we just use categories and, and functors as data for our models. So categories, functors, the category of sets and relations, free categories generated for a quiver, which is called path category in agda categories, presheaves, and an interesting fact that category presheaves is complete, relational presheaves and morphism which, between them, which wasn't actually too difficult to formalize. And so, as I mentioned, the functoriality and set to equality preservation can be a bit of annoying to prove, but not necessarily too hard. They're just, um, let's say, a bit of um, a bookkeeping that you need to do in order to work with the library. But again, uh, these, uh, these um, definitions and notions are not too uh, theoretical. They're not too, uh, uh, they're not too in-depth into the categorical perspective to, let's say, test, uh, stress test the, the library in, in, in our setting, right? And um, I think I'm going to be skipping this part, uh, as interesting as it is, because uh, there's not too much time. And so just to uh, conclude, and as we've seen, I presented some, a sketch of the categorical semantics of counterpart-based temporal logics. And... I told you a bit about the formalization in Agda. So there are many possible extensions of this work in many di different directions. For example, on the temporal logic side, we could expand and extend QLTL to express set, set quantification with the second order QLTL, or also consider different kinds of temporal logics, such as uh, CTL and CTL star, which actually have, uh, let's say, more, more expressive, more complex models. And another interesting thing would be to see whether uh, a proof assistance can be easily interfaced uh, in the context of model checking to use external solvers and be more efficient when, for example, providing counterexamples or of proof searching for uh, temporal logic formulas. And an interesting thing on uh, the categorical side is that we could formalize the syntax and the model of our logics using the, the tools of categorical logic. So uh, using index categories and morphism between them to also provide the syntax of the logic itself. And as of now, a study of uh, temporal logics uh, presented with a proof assistant is still absent in the literature. So there's not too much about it. There's uh, some work by Nipkov. And uh, another interesting aspect that is uh, starting to, to, to rise up is that the, is the, these kind of decisions that need to be taken when designing a library for uh, reasoning with category, category theory and categories. And uh, there's some not too much work about it, but uh, the, 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 this first article here is uh, the documentation, let's say, the rationale for some of the design choices of Agda categories and uh, another work in, uh, in, in Koch for, um, in 2014, which uh, talks about other interesting aspects of formalizing category theory uh, in, in Koch and proof assistance. Thank you. Hey, any question? Okay, so if uh, there are no questions, I think uh, we can conclude the session here and we thank the speaker again. <laughs>